You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Good morning, I'm Chrissy DeClerc Salagi. And I'm Jason Salagi with today's Caffeinated History with the Salagis on the BQN Podcast Collective. Before we jump into our topic for the day, we'd like to take a moment to thank our BQN Patreon patrons who make our show possible. Listeners, you can hear your name listed here as one of our associate producers with a monthly subscription of just $10 at patreon.com slash bqn. And with a monthly Patreon subscription of $5 or more, you can join our meetings of the hive mind on the second Saturday of each month. Watch your Patreon messages for details. Today's topic is American poet Phyllis Wheatley. In the era of American slavery, it was very odd for any slave to be educated, much less an enslaved woman. Even so, the first book of poetry by a black American woman was written by Phyllis Wheatley while she was enslaved. She was taken from her African home in 1761, around the age of seven. We cannot be sure about her age, nor do we know her given name, but she was called Phyllis by the Wheatley family, who purchased her in Boston that year. Phyllis was the name of the ship on which she had been taken across the Atlantic. We also do not know why the Wheatleys chose to educate Phyllis. One clue may lie in the reason for her purchase. Some sources say she was intended to be a companion to John Wheatley's wife, Susanna. If this were the case, they may have wanted to make it so that Phyllis could read aloud for the family's entertainment. Whatever the reason, under the tutelage of John and Susanna's daughter Mary, she learned not only English, but Latin and Greek as well. This was a level of education uncommon for a man in that time, much less a woman, and far less an enslaved woman. Her skills were exhibited to guests with readings of Homer, Virgil, and modern philosophers. Phyllis began writing poetry at the age of 14. She soon gained local fame with a tribute upon the death of George Whitefield, a minister and evangelist who was one of the founders of the Methodist denomination. By 1773, she had compiled a book of poetry, which she sought to publish. A sort of introduction was written and signed by prominent Bostonians, including John Hancock and Thomas Hutchinson, as a letter to the public attesting that the young enslaved woman was indeed the author of these poems. She traveled to London with the Wheatley's son, Nathaniel, and there found patronage from William Blake, the Earl of Dartmouth, and Selina, the Countess of Huntington, with which she found a publisher. Her book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, was first published in late 1773. Phyllis quickly became well-known amongst Londoners and beyond, and arrangements were made for her to be presented to King George III, though she and Nathaniel had to return to Massachusetts before it could be organized. Many of her readers were vocally concerned about the enslaved status of the author. They cited a recent ruling in Somerset v. Stewart, in which the presiding judge, William Murray, the Earl of Mansfield, stated that an enslaved person in England could not be forcibly removed from English soil to be returned to a state of slavery. It's difficult to imagine Phyllis was not aware of the Mansfield ruling, and since she writes of having been freed shortly after getting back to Boston, perhaps she used it to her advantage to improve her position when returning home. Her manumission in the beginning of the American Revolution turned her writing toward ideas of freedom. She wrote in praise of George Washington and the efforts of the Americans, while also criticizing the continued practice of slavery. Washington responded to her poem with compliments and an invitation to visit him at the headquarters, which she took up. While the general, however, appreciated her work, his congressional colleague Thomas Jefferson found her work, quote, below the dignity of criticism. In 1778 or 79, she married John Peters, a free black grocer in Boston. They had little money, and Peters was imprisoned for debt in 1784, at which point a pregnant Phyllis had to take on work as a scullery maid in order to support herself and their son. She died on the 5th of December, 1784, from pneumonia combined with complications in childbirth. Thank you for listening. We'd also like to thank our History with the Zalagis Patreon patrons, Patty, Susan Capozzi de Clerc, Laura Dell, Chris Hill, Betty Larson, and Vince Locke. Their contributions help us to have the time to research and write what you're hearing. You can help us just like they do with a monthly subscription at patreon.com slash history with the Zaloggies. Also, thank you to Mark White for the awesome show art and Zach Tripp for the wonderful closing music. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast player and don't forget to rate and review us there as well. And while you're at it, check out the rest of the great shows on the BQN Collective. We'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to reach out, you can find our network on Twitter at BQN Podcasts, and this podcast in particular at History Zalagi. You can also talk about any and all of our BQN podcasts in the Facebook group, the BQN Collective. And last but not least, you can find me on Twitter at the Goddess Livia. That's T-H-E-G-O-D-D-E-S-S-L-I-V-I-A. And me at Jason Dark Elf. We'd love to hear topic suggestions. What would you like to learn on Caffeinated History? History.